Hey everyone, and welcome to one more episode of Protecting Wildlife. And today we have a special guest, a guest I have a contact with for so many years, and I'm so blessed to have you here. Here, she is called Nancy Warren, and welcome to this one more episode of Protecting Wildlife. Thank you. So, so why I picked Nancy is in this interview to you, to you guys is because Nancy is a big, big passion for wolf and really educate people in the awareness about wolf, what to not be afraid of, because as you know, a lot of people out there is afraid of wolf and don't know exactly what information around them, and what is a wolf exactly, the behavior of wolf, what they're doing in the nature. So we, there is a lot of fear around it. So we hope to break that down and see what like what is the benefit with wolves is in the nature and what why we need them in the wild nature. So they're working with the, the information about wolves and get it out there. And as also know, you're also working with the government. Is that correct, Nancy? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So tell me a little bit about what is the Wolf Watchers, because this okay. is the organization you are working yes. with. Thank you. Um, I'm the executive director of the National Wolf Watcher Coalition. And we were started about 2010 by a group of friends who wanted an organization that's dedicated solely to the advocating for wolves. Um, there are many organizations out there, um, but they, the wolves are just a component of those organizations. We wanted to stress education, advocacy and participating in activities that would promote a positive um, image of the wolf as well as their long-term recovery. We're an all volunteer organization. Um, none of us is paid. Um, we have no membership dues, which is another plus for many um, organizations. Um, doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, you can join us. Um, we have a free newsletter that is available on our website, which is wolfwatcher.org, W-O-L-F-W-A-T-C-H-E-R.org. And I believe you'll be posting our website and other links um, to get the latest information about wolves in the United States. Yeah. And so you, all the information Nancy is just giving you, there's like a worksheet in the new site you get, and there stands all the information you need um, from the organization. So it's like connecting together. What is the workbook that will we come to in the end of the interview? So Nancy, what are the three biggest threats you're facing in your work around wolves? The biggest threat is trying to counter misinformation. Out there, there are so many people have an irrational fear of wolves. They think wolves are eating all the deer. They think they're going to attack people. Um, none of that is true. And so we spend most of our time countering misinformation, going to meetings that are held by the government agencies to give the accurate information. That's the one thing we try to do. Um, another thing based on that misinformation, we have a lot of illegal kills. And I was just talking with um, someone in um, Nepal who was telling me that that's an age old problem, even in Nepal, where people um, don't understand the wolf, don't understand the benefits of wolves. And so when they see a wolf, they illegally kill it. And the third major threat is in the states here, we have very aggressive hunting policies. And again, it all goes back to that misinformation. Um, these hunting policies are not based on science. They're political appointees um, who are catering to a very small subset of our population who think that wolves should be killed. Um, and so we're going back a century ago, we eradicated wolves because of those fears. And now we're turning back that clock. That is amazing. And I know there's a lot of work to really get good information out there. So what you call this, so people can see what right. benefit the wolves is doing for the environment. Right. 
and we strive on scientific data. So we work with a lot of researchers who will share their data with us. Um, and again, all that is posted to our website. Yeah. So if you want to know anything about any aspect of wolves, you can go to the website and get more information. We can't even contain everything in just an hour long interview. No, is there a show? <laughs> So how do we deal with this three threat you're just sharing a little bit about? How do we deal with them and turn around to something powerful in your work? Well, the way to turn it around is by countering misinformation. So many people feel helpless. They go, oh yeah, it's just so-and-so talking about it and we're not going to change their mind. But what we have to do is change the minds of people who really aren't living about with wolves all the time. So um, letters to the editor are very effective, writing to newspapers. Um, we do have freedom of the press here in the United States. And so when when we see letters that um, or articles that are negative towards the wolf, we write a letter. In fact, just yesterday, I submitted one to one of our local newspapers saying that their information in the paper was totally wrong. Oh. Um, and so we just keep countering that. We go to meetings, um, speak up at meetings. Earlier this month, I was at a meeting here in Michigan and gave my little three-minute speech on why their programs are wrong. So, mm -hmm. um, so we just have to keep countering it. We have a very active Facebook page, which we also will post information that will empower others to be able to speak up and advocate for the wolf. That is, that is so beautiful. And I get like the feeling, and I also know you're doing that, like you're in the front of the line and inspire and move people also to follow through, follow you and like be on the line with you. So it's like a team and it's so inspired to see how much you're working for the world together with others to really get the knowledge out there, be on data and facts around the mm -hmm. world. So it's so beautiful to see um, the movement you are doing for well, the I have and for other people. I have to say, I'm inspired by you and all the work that you have done to promote wildlife and coexistence with wildlife. I have spent most of my life working for wolves, but you are doing everything for all animals and all species around the world. So um, you are to be commended for that. I just am, again, one little spoke in your big wheel. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We all have a part to play in this life, in this, I really believe we all have a part to play in protecting wildlife, to play, protecting the nature, the animals, we all have a part and it's all starting in our lifestyle choices, like what we're going out to buy in the grocery, what we're choosing on vacation, what, how we are speaking with other people about information, like we all have a part to play in this world. Mm -hmm. And I really hope uh, this interview also can really move others to see they have a part to play to really to protect the, the wolf and mm -hmm. be part of your organization to really get the movement going um, stronger and uh, over the globe. Right. And it's all yeah. about awareness. So yeah. many people walk past things and don't pay attention to it. Um, something as innocent as a butterfly or, you know, another insect. Everything is connected in this world. Um, exactly. We're all under the same moon. We're all under the same sun. And we are all connected no matter where we are in the world. Oh, that's so beautiful. Like every piece, like every species matter in this life. If it's an ant, or if it's an elephant, it's a wolf, like every species matter. Mm -hmm. of the, the, the wild animals. This is not different with humans, I would say. I will talk about <laughs> animals. Yes, <laughs> yes, for sure. I mean, and just when you look at the wolf and the impact the wolf has had on the environment, yeah. wolf, where, where there are wolves, there is greater biodiversity. Um, wolves impact the forestry um, mm. and native wildflowers. And what, how that happens is because they feed on deer and elk, 
those are the prey, the main prey base here in the States. Um, and then it causes deer and elk to spend less time in a particular area. Mm -hmm. And so it allows for tree jet regeneration, um, cedar, hemlock trees. There's also a better quality of trees in areas where there's wolves. Um, things like maple and oak um, are constantly nibbled and eaten by the ungulates, by the deer. And oh. so they end up growing up all crooked and everything. Well, if you're in the forestry and you want clean lumber, you want nice straight lumber. Um, there's also a greater variety of native wildflowers and bushes because deer like to eat our native wildflowers. And so deer have to stay on the alert and afraid of predators. So they need to eat or they're gonna be eaten. And mm. so they will avoid some of these areas which allows these flowers to grow, uh, the wildflowers, which in turn attracts insects, which in turn attracts uh, butterflies and birds. So everything, again, is connected with a greater variety. And then also um, with all this lush growth in our forest floor, it becomes very thick in the foliage, and that makes it better for your ground nesting birds. So um, that's just one small aspect of how wolves can change a landscape. Um, mm. The absence of wolves um, will cause degradation on our forests, and, um, and we could see that on Isle Royal here, um, an island where there's a moose-wolf relationship. The moose were decimating the trees by eating all the balsam, and then the wolves mm. helped keep the moose in check. So it's everything is just all centered around and how things are so much better when you have wolves in the area. Mm, yeah, that makes that makes sense. And for me, that is key then for me. So I get also the miss like the pace on my head is if there was too many deers, if there's too many ills in a one area, mm -hmm. like there was like you told me there would be no wildflowers, the insect will not be so much there and tree will be like broken and die because all the like going off the tree and if the wolf is there it's called more like spreading and the nature exactly has more time to grow and get insects and all that diverse as nature needs right exactly and then also um besides the um deer and the elk be the um, beaver makes up another substantial portion of the wolf's diet and so they actually can ambush a beaver well in the states oh here beaver cause considerable damage um they flood roads um they mm -hmm. block culverts they cause a lot of damage that cost taxpayers a lot of money to repair and you know the wolf is a natural predator of the beaver and then another aspect that people just don't seem to realize is and I tell this even story if you've ever played hide and seek or tag with the, as a child um, who are you going to catch? You're going to catch the easiest one. You're going to catch yeah. the one who's slow. You're going to catch the one who trips. You're going to get the one who makes a mistake. And that's exactly how wolves hunt. Wolves are going to go after the easiest ones to catch. And so that's going to be the oldest, Unfortunately, mm. I'm the old category, <laughs> the young, um, the young, and those are those deer are the least productive of the herd. The strongest and the healthiest are left to re um, to repopulate the pop the deer population. Mm. Um, wolves can also detect illness at a much mm. earlier age or stage of a disease. We have wow. a disease called chronic wasting disease here and it's spreading rapidly in areas. Ironically, it is showing up in areas where we have the fewest deer or fewest wolves. Oh, and so what happens with this is, and wolves can detect this disease at a very early stage, and evidence suggests that they might be even slowing the spread of the disease. 
Mm. Um, this disease is only to animals or it's also going only to humans? Well, they have, they're still doing research on that, but they do think there may be a link to the CWD and humans. It's very similar to some other diseases. Um, so far, there haven't been any evidence, there hasn't been any evidence of it being transmitted to humans, but they also caution people not to eat these animals if they're mm. infected um, and to use um, different kinds of gloves if they're gutting the animal and stuff like that. And it's a disease that isn't spread to the wolves. And so the wolves will then consume all the um, all of the animal when they take it down. These prions from this particular disease, and I'm not a biologist, but these prions can stay in the ground for a year. And then well, that is long time. Oh, it's wow. a long time. And that's how that disease continues to infect other deer. And so by wolves breaking that chain, the research indicates that they may even be slowing the spread. And since this is kind of a new disease, we don't have it's not definite yet, but there sure are indications that they can do that. That is so this is a new disease that is in where you are? What in relatively, the it's relatively new. Um, in the um, state where I live, it's Michigan. Um, it is in the lower peninsula. Michigan is shaped somewhat like that. And in the lower peninsula where we don't have any wolves, it's in very, several counties now, and it's affecting the deer population there. Where mm -hmm. I live up in the upper peninsula of Michigan, it's almost shaped like a hand we've had one case and all the wolves are located in the upper peninsula of my state that is crazy so yeah one, I, like one point the disease will spread to like mm -hmm. spreading to yeah. other countries to other lands with years i believe right. And so there seems to be a correlation, and the same thing is showing true in Wisconsin. Most of the disease-infected deer are in an area where we have very few wolves. So um, I tell deer hunters, if you care about hunting deer, and that's a big sport here, well, then you should like wolves, because wolves are going to help a I'll slow the spread. I won't even say eradicate because we may never be able to eradicate a disease like that, but we might be able to slow the spread. Mm, that is that is a very interesting thing that's going on mm -hmm. to see that's like and I, I like <laughs> with nature and what all the disease is like what I, I believe Mother Nature is fighting back and mm -hmm. Mother Nature is doing things when we are Interrupting the ecosystem. So exactly if breaking the cycling of Mother Earth. The Mother Earth is fighting back and put something, I believe, to wake up us to and see, hey guys, wolf is important for my ecosystem to working and drive and are thriving around so you can get food, air, you name it. Exactly. Food. Exactly. Um, you know, we have these diseases coming up because of overpopulation of certain animals, mm -hmm. and we have removed the apex predators. And so um, humans have moved into the, uh, these animals are trying to exist in a human landscape. Um, and that's what's happening. You know, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we are causing these issues because of a congregation. Uh, chronic wasting disease is spread by nose to nose contact and saliva. And so when you start bringing a lot of deer together, say through baiting or something like that, you're exposing the deer to these diseases. And, um, and so, so yeah, so the wolves can play a critical role by because they do remove the sick and the weak, and they do it at an earlier stage. And yeah, then the wolves was some place. I think it was in USA. I know USA is huge. I know they was putting wolves out. I believe it was USA, where the ecosystem was so dead, and after a few years, there was like flowers, bees. Yes. There's so beautiful picture and video to see. Oh my God, have this just changed because of the wolves? That is crazy. Yes, you're talking about Yellowstone National yes. Park. 
that's our, it's one of our national parks where wolves were reintroduced there in 1995 where i live the wolves came here naturally they moved in from other states um, in minnesota wisconsin and michigan they were not introduced but in yellowstone they were and just one of the things they've done other than all the ecological um, improvements that they've made with the elk and um, all that um it has brought in 35 million dollars a year to the surrounding communities because yellowstone national park is like a big fishbowl you could stand on a ridge and see the wolves interacting um it's oh one of the God. only places in the world where you could actually see wolves um taking down elk chasing bison living as a wolf should be and it is just simply amazing um and i have been there several times and i have been moved to tears standing there just watching um, pups play um just being wolves and then this is where the politics come into play when it leaves the confines of a national park where they're protected they can be hunted in other state in the states mm -hmm. like wyoming and montana so um and that's another thing we're fighting for the ecotourism because wolves just bring in so much money from people who like to go to yellowstone to watch wolves um and it is is simply an amazing place um you could put a spotting scope on them and see them a half a mile a mile away and just watch them through a scope um i have arrived there before dawn in the morning and heard them howling and it just fills the mountain area mm. um and it, it is just simply you know a magical place and it's not just yellowstone we have other areas where wolves have brought in economic benefit we have the international wolf center which is an educational facility they have um captive wolves but they have um, bring in about three million dollars to their local community because of people who visit this little town in northern minnesota and they've helped create about 60 jobs so you know it's a lot of jobs, you know, it's a lot of jobs for a very small area and then we also have the red wolf in uh the southeast portion of our country where it's boosted tourism and brought in 37 million dollars so we oh. are trying to show the economic benefit of wolves and how they can benefit local economy through education because the wolf is very very popular um when we've done surveys in that yellowstone national park and the number one animal that people hope to see is the wolf so they are coming to Yellowstone specifically to see or hoping to see the wolf and rarely are they disappointed. So anyone who's looking to travel to the US once COVID is under control, yeah. um, that's a great place to, um, to start mm. to look for wolves. Definitely, definitely. Mm. This is on the map, yeah. <laughs> on the map yeah and if you come to michigan uh I, will. I can't i can't promise you'll see a wolf but i'm hoping you might be able to hear them or see them i live in a very forested area um but wolves do use my property um oh, and wow. so um and you yeah. sent me one of your pics one time of a wolf like oh my god yep and so yeah i would be so lucky it's like Wee. yep and just the other day, uh, yesterday, in fact, I found some wolf scat on our road right outside our, you know, just off our house. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, we have wolves around here. I get them on video. I get them on trail cam. We sometimes hear them howl. Mm -hmm. um, rarely do we see them. Maybe once or twice a year I might see them. Um, last year i did see four of them crossing our my road into my property so oh, they're wow. here and that's another thing many people may never ever see a wolf but they feel good knowing that they're here mm. and that's called intrinsic value and wow. so there's a value on them that you can't 
put on anything else. It's just a value that I feel deep inside. Like you may never be to Yellowstone, but you feel good knowing that wolves are in Yellowstone. And also the Native Americans highly respect the wolf or most tribes. Anyway, just about all the yeah. tribes in the U.S. highly respect and they admire the wolf for their hunting abilities, their family, community. Oh um, my God, cause, like cause, how you work in the pack is like right. amazing. Just like it's something magical to see, like how you work in the pack. Like yes. you know the state, you know where to go, you know who yes. is who. Every just animal, just, yeah, each other is just yes. every animal within the pack has a role to play. Um, yeah, exactly. and, and that's what makes it so incredible. It's there's so much like the human family with a dominant male and female as the head. You may have some juveniles and then the younger ones, the pups of the year, the juveniles help take care of the younger ones, um, babysit for them. Um, they do all that. Um, maybe sometimes I, I've seen video of this where sometimes the older animal is too old to hunt or maybe injured from a hunt and the others will bring it food. Um, you may have one wolf in the pack that's the fastest runner and might be more adept at bringing down prey. Um, but then you have the older animals who are the teachers and they will teach the young where to hunt, how to hunt. And again, not unlike our own human family where we teach our children how to cook, how to mow a lawn, how to do things. They are teaching their young how to survive in the world. Mm. Um, yeah, so and I, have a, I have a question. So there is a myth, a myth if I say that correctly. Yes. So some people in Denmark, uh, in Jutland where the wolf is, I don't know if the wolf is more in Denmark because people have shut it down illegally, um, illegally it's called. Like, right, correct. Okay, correct. perfect. Um, because there are so many that are afraid of you will be mm -hmm. killed by a wolf to go into nature. And I was like, the wolf is more scared by you and you are the, <laughs> the wolf. You maybe never see a wolf because the wolf can hear you a long, long distance and know you are human and know you're not a food for them. So, so that myth about wolf will eat you if you go in the forest, is that correct? <laughs> it is definitely a myth. Um, I am in the forest all the time. I take my dog for a walk in the forest where there's wolves. I've never been eaten. I've never been approached by one. Um, I have seen them very close up front. Um, and it all comes back to Little Red Riding Hood stories. Mm -hmm. And then the stories of the boy who cried wolf, you know, all these stories we grew up with. Mm -hmm. and, and when you see a wolf, a wolf is a very large animal. They stand very tall and they look at you very curiously. They'll look at you and stare at you. And some people perceive that as a threat. And where all you have to do if you do see a wolf is to just raise your arm, shake and you shout, and it is going to run. Um, now, on the other hand, what we have to make sure we don't do is habituate these wolves and mm -hmm. allow these wolves to come close to you. Um, a wolf doesn't understand if you run out of marshmallows. You know, if you're feeding this wolf, um, and I have un unfortunately known some people, oh, they were feeding a sandwich to the wolf. Ooh, That's wow. a very bad thing to do because then the wolf becomes very accustomed to being around people. Mm -hmm. um, and where this has happened is in campgrounds and stuff like that, where people go, oh, there's a wolf. Let's give him some of our bologna. And, um, and that could call, make a wolf very dangerous because they're going to come into this site. They don't understand and they're going to be looking for an easy source of food. So the best thing you could do is to just keep you know, your distance with a wolf. But that's where some of these stories come from. And then in some countries like India, for example, there have been attacks on um, people by wolves. And in part, that's because of where the, the way they're living, they have their cows or their um, 
livestock close to where they're living and um, unguarded. Um, they might be sleeping outside and things like that. So there is a difference. Here in the States, in all of North America, there have been two cases of fatal wolf attacks on humans. Two. Oh, this, this not yeah. Much. That in the last hundred years, we're going back a hundred years. And here in the States, you know, I, I laugh at this one because, you know, who's afraid of the big bad wolf? And we've had two attacks in a hundred years in all of North America. And yet every year we have people who are killed by a cow, you know, <laughs> cow deaths, you know, 20, 20, 22 people a year are trampled by a cow or a bull. So we're going, and we live with thousands of cattle and people don't think of it. You know, a mosquito can transmit oh West God. Nile virus and kill you. And again, look at what's happening with this uh, coronavirus, with COVID-19. Um, people just being in a family gathering can die from a virus. And so we try to put this fear in a perspective too. Mm. You know, yeah, any, that's a good one. Yeah. any wild animal can be dangerous. A squirrel can be dangerous um, if you're feeding a squirrel. So any wild animal, but as far as animals go, wolves are really, they don't see you as food. And so, um, is an extremely low risk um, to humans by wolves. And we also have, you know, regarding livestock losses, there are mm -hmm. so many things that livestock owners can do to avoid conflict with wolves. Um, I have a farm near me that for years had guard dogs. Guard dogs are extremely mm -hmm. effective. Another farmer near me has donkeys that have been very good donkeys don't donkeys. like wolves donkeys they don't like wolves and so what will happen is they literally just patrol the area and if a wolf comes nearby they just start making a lot of noise and causing a lot of issues they just um, love so, noises yeah you know they'll, and they kick and they do a lot of other things and so um they spit they kick they're mean and um and the wolves don't like the donkeys and so there are things farmers can do, producers can do to mitigate problems. We have um, a whole array of um, non-lethal tools so that we don't have to kill a wolf. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even things like here in the States, we have um, car dealerships that have these big blow up dolls, you know, that go up and they make all kinds of noise those are also effective in keeping wolves away. The wolves I don't like that. the surprise, you know, the surprise noise of making the, all this movement. And so it spooks them and they will stay away from the farm. And then also in the event, wolves, wolves eventually learn that or can learn that these flags that they'll use are just orange flags and there's nothing to be afraid of. And then electric fencing is very effective, but sometimes the wolf will say, oh, that, that isn't so bad. You know, I can, I can handle that shock. And so if they do become accustomed to all these non-lethal tools, we can very directly address that problem. And sometimes we do have to kill that wolf. Um, because, as I said earlier, it's a learned behavior, and we don't want a wolf to teach its young to keep killing um, livestock. So that it's, might be good. Yeah, it's so sad to really also know that uh, about wolf when a person like feeds the wolves get like new habit because I get food mm -hmm. over there. Of course, the animal will go over there because then mm -hmm. I will get food over there. And that can be so dangerous. Also, bears um, mm -hmm. and other animals. I hear stories about um, also in the, what was it like? Also in Guatemala, where I've just been for five months. Like we never leave garbage outside because the animals come. Exactly. The, door. the food will be that you close everything so tight up so they don't get it. So they know That's we will not get food on this proper area 
because if it's happened like that, or if you're feeding a wild monkey, exactly, if you're feeding the wild monkey that was there, they come closer, closer to the humans, like to the exactly. volunteers, to the tourists. And sometimes they need to put it down because it's too dangerous for exactly. the tourists, for the volunteers, because they can really make damage. And also with the wolves, it's so sad to see how much our ego as a human can destroy an animal because it's like if i don't done that it is my fault if the animals will be um, printed or learn new behavior and um, this is my fault and i like i will mm -hmm. not be a person that is in this because a wild animal is a wild animal it's not like a cat, a cat or a dog a wild animal is a wild animal, and that's why you need to keep distant and then don't eat bread, cookies, whatever you <laughs> exactly. eat. Exactly. They eat exactly. things in the nature. They don't like cat or dog, don't eat it either, but still, that is so exactly. different in what a wild animal is. Wolves even have a sweet tooth. So if um, you're leaving, like, um, now, right now, it's bear baiting. Uh, many hunters are getting ready to hunt a black bear in the state, mm. and they'll put out a lot of bait to attract the bears. Well, that also attracts wolves, oh and my so we, you know, we need to limit the baiting or keep it so that other animals can't access it. And again, what you said about trash is so true. Um, feeding your pets outside and leaving dog or cat food outside will attract not just wolves, but some of the smaller animals, um, a skunk, a raccoon, um, and porcupines. Um, all those animals close to the home could injure your pet. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mice, mice, rats, like things that come with disease like right and you don't want rats in your house or mice yeah. in your house and stuff so that's another thing we do it's all a part of education and people don't sometimes think of that they'll think so casually well i'm just feeding my dog outside okay when your dog is done bring in that bowl bring it don't leave food outside for them you don't want to attract animals wild animals and if they do come to your house make noise make it unpleasant for that animal animal to be near you. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a coyote um, that was real close to the house and we fired, my husband fired a gun in the air, just a loud boom to scare off that coyote. We never saw it again. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make it so that it's unpleasant for wildlife to be near me. Yeah, um, and, and, and you serve the animals that yeah, you're helping the animals to the animals know we are doing going over there because it's too mm -hmm. dangerous with the noises, like so these don't come again most of like right. most of the times not coming over there. So I mean we also even get to be in service and really, yeah, of course it's so amazing to see wild animals. And still is also to know, but this is not natural a wild animal is coming so close to you. This is not natural. So right. that's why it's so important to make the noises because it's not natural for human and wild animals to be together. Like, right. And even even bird food, um, I put out I like to put out sunflower oilers because I enjoy feeding the birds, but that can attract bears. So I have to make sure that I don't have any feed left outside because I don't want a bear coming up on my porch. Um, no. Not and really. just not even, uh, this is kind of funny too. Um, I feed hummingbirds and I give them oh. sugar water and I enjoy having them out here. And I had filled up the bird feeder and by morning it was empty. And I thought, what in the world? drank my hummingbird food and so I set a trail cam up on it and sure enough it was a raccoon coming around stood up on its hind end and drank my hummingbird food so now I have to make sure I don't leave any hummingbird food in in the feeder overnight and then in the morning I get up and I put more food out for them for the day. And the same thing I do with my um, oilers for my birds, because I, I don't want bears coming around. So yeah. it's I think, I think Yeah, I think it's so important to also remember like where is the boundaries going? How much do I feed? 
when do I feed and how much do I put out to also keep wild and wild because of course it's so nice to see a bird as someone else mm -hmm. and coming close of course but also so important to know is this, this from my own egoistic like ego yes feeling I want to or is it for the animals I'm doing that most of the time human do it because we want it but it's not Mm -hmm. serving the animals to do it exactly yeah. and so even in the summertime i cut back on the feeding of my birds because they really don't need it it's just that we're in a drought and we don't have the flowers like we usually do because we definitely need some rain here um, and so i give them a little bit just enough to keep them coming <laughs> but yeah, not enough to affect the other animals and so it's just an awareness is what yeah. we're trying to do and yeah exactly it's like awareness to see on where the line is because we are in global warming and sometimes here in Denmark it was like a heat and everything was just like dead of course it's so important to put some fruits and out to the birds to get some sugar because Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the animals in Denmark, I think it was for two summers ago, it was suffering because it was never so hot in Denmark before. Like you, there was not grass, the grass was yellow. So of right. course at that point, it's also important to know like, when do I serve the animals, when do I do it for my own mm -hmm. behavior, when it's right. for myself, so know like, when do you do it, out from where, um, yeah. Right. So in the last end, um, I would love to ask you with that knowledge you have today around wolf, what advice do you want to give to the audience to change their lifestyles around that? Well, se uh, several things. Wolves really can exist in marginal habitat. They don't need total wilderness, but they do need travel corridors in order to disperse fine mates and things like that. So I tell people we have to work to protect certain areas. We don't need to make the entire country a playground or a wilderness area, but we do need to set aside certain areas for wolves and other large carnivores to be able to disperse, whether it's a mountain lion, a wolf, a bear. And so that's one thing we can do. And how can we help protect some habitat with um, recycling and reusing materials? We want to save some of these materials. We don't have to keep, we live in a throwaway society and we really need to be conscious of what we're doing and what we're doing to this planet. Um, I have switched um, in the last couple of months, I didn't even know this stuff existed, plant-based laundry detergent, um, where it's not, you no know, chemicals, it's better for you, it's better for the environment, it's better for the earth. Um, and so um, just being aware of the products we use, um, aware of where those products are coming from and what we're doing. I know we all love cell phones now, we all have phones and things like that, but they're really very damaging to the environment. Um, not only aesthetically with the uh, cell towers, but the components that are made. So knowing an awareness of where these materials come from and how that may be affecting wolves and to make that sustainable, not just for wolves, but for other animals. Is there another way we can do it? Um, or how can we do it minimally affecting it? So when we do this mining, are we causing um, sulfur or what other things, other bad things to go into our rivers, polluting our streams? Everything again is connected. Um, unfortunately, so much of this is tied to money, but working with corporations to say, Hell no, you're not going to do this unless you can do it in an environmentally sustainable way. I'm not going to support you. And um, again, awareness, going out and, and doing this. Along with wolves, some of the things I have done is fought for having uh, protected areas. And sometimes some of these areas even have a contract where uh, the corporations are trying to avoid the terms of their contract. And we go, no, 
bring them back to this. But again, um, sometimes using the media, getting the word out by the media. So I tell people to try and protect corridors, understand how valuable the land is. Um, and we practice what we preach. We only have and the whole scheme of things, we're a dot on the map. We have 280 acres, but we have protected our land forever um, by a conservation easement. And so our land will never be developed and chopped up into little subdivisions. Um, it will stay forever wild. Um, mm. And so, yeah. Yeah, that is so, so beautiful. So, so you are there, like also what Nancy says. Us as a consumer, each person have a role to play and it is our responsibility to look at where is this product coming from? What do I want to support? Because when we buy something, we're supporting every step for the first step to make the product, to get it in the house or have it on mm -hmm. you. The whole way, what everything that has been doing in the process, we are supporting. And this is our duty as I believe, and I see it, to really know what is good for the environment and also good for you. Because if you mm -hmm. get back to the environment and get a big awareness around that, you also get a better health because right. we, yeah. we need nature to live on earth. We right. need animals to be on earth because it's going in a circle and each animal playing a big part beside the human uh, in mm -hmm. we can live on earth. Exactly. And, you know, we need to limit the amount of waste that's going to um, landfills. Um, yeah. That's another big issue. Um, where are we going to dispose of this waste? Um, yeah. So the more we can use uh, things like even as simple as a compost pile, um, where table scraps and things like that can be returned to the earth. Um, just mm -hmm. simple things that can be done. Um, yeah. Limit the use of raw materials, how often yeah. we can use other stuff that we don't have to keep, you know, just taking and taking and taking. It's time for yeah. us to give back to nature. Exactly. Yeah, also that like focus on what you're buying and how can you, you we use it again, like I'm, I'm drinking our, our well, there have been pickles in it. So this mm -hmm. is my glass, so my glass is different sizes because I bought this glass, so why should I go out to buy gla new glasses when I just bought a glass and it's... <laughs> Same yeah. thing here. <laughs> um, we have, we vow ourselves that we never buy water in bottles. You know, yeah. why buy water in bottles when you can fill up your glass and have it? Um, yeah. And... Good. And so just things like that, people want convenience, but as consumers, if we change our lifestyle, they have to change to go along with us because they're in it to make money. And exactly. so if you it's tell them- from, It's coming from the ground. We as a human, each person, we need to push the government and show the way because the government is not making the change because it's all about money. And if right. we change in our lifestyles in the small step, each and us, we are pushing the government to see other areas, opportunities where they can get money. Exactly. New habits. Yeah. So, you know, when we go to companies and tell, this is just a really funny story, but one day I get a phone call from a friend of mine and I didn't have any small children at the time, but she said, have you seen the Lucky Charms um, cereal box no i don't buy lucky charms i don't have any kids and she said go pick one up and i go and do and in the back there was this little puzzle and um I find the big bad wolf and i went what big bad wolf on a box a lucky charm i wrote to general mills who produces the cereal and i said this is a very bad reflection on the wolf i got a letter back and they said we will change our box yeah, and they did. Crazy. You know, so just little things like that of making people aware of what's happening and you write to a company and say, I'm not going to buy your product because I don't like the way you're portraying wildlife or the environment or your packaging. Um, and it actually saves them money by using less packaging. Um, 
So, you know, if, if we can, we can change if we go to consumers or as consumers go to these companies and just tell them what we will and will not accept, mm. you know, and, and so, yeah. so I think there's some things we can do and it wouldn't just benefit wolves, it benefits all wildlife, it benefits the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, everything is affected. Oh um, my God, yeah, it's so true, so yes. true. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's so beautiful. So thank you so, so much, Nancy, to be a part of Protect Wildlife in the Ozone. It has been a pleasure, blessing, blessing. Oh my God, blessing to have you here. Um, well, I really, really love to talk with you. We can have a long talk, I believe that. <laughs> well, thank you so <laughs> much for fun. having me. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for all the work you're doing. We couldn't do it without you. We all, even across the world, um, we're working together. So hand in hand, we're going to make a difference. Even hand on the circle. We need to unite to stand yes. together. Yeah, and that is what I really, the, one of the purpose with this NDO is to unite more or the organization to organization and spread the word because I really believe together we're stronger instead of pulling ourselves small pieces in each organization to like really work on a global and push um, the government to change things. Yeah, that's what we're gonna do. Thank yeah. you so much. You're most welcome. Keep in touch. Keep All right. Bye now. Bye.